Hello and welcome. Uh, you are listening to an interview with the co-founder of Slack where we are talking about the story of the process when Slack was founded because they did not start as Slack itself. They did start as something completely different and it was a second try of this thing when they founded Flickr before and in this interview I'm talking to Cal Henderson where we are talking about cryptocurrencies, emerging markets, building communities with Slack, how to build your team, then also how to turn something that seems to be negative into a positive thing and create a new business case, how to bring your SaaS product into new companies or for new clients, and many, many more topics. And I wish you a great, great uh, listen to my interview. And yeah, enjoy the day, enjoy the, the interview, and let's see what you can get out of it. Welcome to the Jung Unternehmer podcast. My name is Fabian Tausch and I'm on the second try with the co-founder of Slack, Cal Henderson. We tried it at TechCrunch Disrupt 2017 and we did an interview. It was really, really great and I messed it up. I didn't have an, a recording in the end. So uh, I asked them to give me another other opportunity to speak to Cal again and Julia, the DPR agent of um, Slack was so polite to give me the opportunity that we can have this call again and do an interview. And Cal, I'm so glad that I have you here in the interview and I'm so, so happy. But I, I first want to, want to remember that you were with three degrees Celsius <laughs> in Berlin with shorts. It so, didn't seem that cold at the time. <laughs> there was no snow that I remember. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not quite sure if there was snow anymore, but um, it was really, really cold. I, I'm really interested. How do you run through the streets in California? <laughs> um, pretty much the same. I'm wearing, you know, it's uh, warm in San Francisco this morning. I'm wearing shorts. It's nice. Yeah. So I should move from Berlin to San Francisco because here it's a rainy day. Everywhere there's fog and rain and whatever, and you have the sun. So maybe maybe I should I should move. <laughs> yeah, the weather the weather here is pretty nice. So um, that said, you're the co-founder of Slack. I hope many of the people know what Slack is, and you also were highly involved in Flickr, and you were spearheading APIs. So every developer or every Buddy who's working with software tools is would love to meet you and is like, whoa, he's the guy because of I can use APIs. So that that's uh, that was really interesting. But where I want to start is um, first, thanks of all again for the interview and welcome to the podcast because I forgot about it because of the <laughs> the short story. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm very very happy to be here. And. Um, when did you start as an entrepreneur? How did it, how did it start for you? Um, <clears throat> I think it was, was kind of accidental. I never, um, I, I knew I wanted to be a, a programmer to make software from a pretty young age, but I thought that I would go and work for some big software company. I thought I'd end up working at Microsoft building apps. And this was kind of before, before the web existed, certainly before the web took off. Um, <clears throat> when I when I first got exposed to the web in the mid '90s, I real like kind of immediately realized that this was um, a platform on which I could make software, and hundreds of people would be able to see it. Maybe even one day, a thousand people would see something I made, and it was so much more immediate than you know, like making desktop software. It was just so exciting. I was like, okay, the web um, is where you know where I want to build software. It's such a transformative platform and that was a very very different time in the kind of mid to late 90s the web was obviously a lot smaller and it's before kind of any of the the big brands that you've heard of today existed um, but it was a very exciting time like this method of delivering software was really inspiring um, I still didn't think I'd be an entrepreneur of any kind I thought like this is just an exciting platform on which to build software and then 
in the kind of early 2000s, I, I fell into working on some really interesting projects just because I wanted to work on software, work on, on tools that I found really exciting. And that's what ended up drawing me to the game that then turned later into Flickr. So you were blogging in the early stages of the web, right? Uh, yeah, I think I started my current blog in 2000, maybe in 99. And at that point, there weren't many people um, who had blogs. You know, it was a recently coined term. And especially in the UK, where I was at the time, we had a mailing list of everyone in the UK who had a blog, which had like 10 or 15 people on it. And we would meet up um, and talk about how cool the internet was and how it was going to be such a big thing. Um, and so it was a really tight knit community and everyone knew everyone else. So you were really, really, really early. Um, that, that was coming clear right now <laughs> because um, I was thinking about blogs and when I think about blogs, it's like, okay, I go to WordPress and I start a blog, but I don't think there was WordPress in 2000. So um, you had to to program it on your own, and what I what I think is really interesting, you said that maybe a hundred or one thousand people might see your software, and now you have a company with one th around one thousand employees, and for, for a software product, just to distribute it and sales and whatever a company does, you have as many people in your company as you thought that they will see the product. <laughs> That, that's yeah, that's really interesting. I, it's definitely crazy to think about it like that, like how far you know the evolution of software delivered over the over the web has come. It's you know like such a like SaaS as a delivery mechanism for software just seems obvious now, but that you know that definitely wasn't the case even a decade ago, and it was kind of unimaginable a couple of decades ago. But now, you know, most um, kind of software services that companies consume are delivered over the internet as SaaS. Yeah, that's right. But as we said, you were you were highly in involved in Flickr, and from Flickr, you went to, to um, do Slack. Um, but how was it to go to Yahoo or before Yahoo Flickr, and uh, instead of Microsoft? Because you said you <laughs> thought about going to Microsoft, and Microsoft is not. Flickr as a startup, as you would call it today, um, how was it different from your your thoughts in the beginning? Well, I really thought that I would just <clears throat> like have a regular job and make software. And at the time, you know, as a kid, I thought that my exposure to software was consumer software. You know, I didn't think I did wasn't aware that there was this world of enterprise software of uh, you know products and services just built for large companies. I was As a teenager, I was completely unaware of that, and I definitely didn't aspire to write enterprise software, as I'm sure pretty much nobody does. Um, and so uh, the experience of like coming from like working in the UK to working on Flickr, or the, the game that then became Flickr, um, was a, a really interesting experience. I mean, Flickr was consumed, still is a consumer product um, that ended up reaching a pretty wide audience. You know, it was... Um, came around um, in the that time of the web, like post.com collapsed, but where we were starting to see a lot of people using consumer products at a kind of, at a rate that we hadn't seen through the dot-com boom. So there were consumer products with tens and then hundreds of millions of users, which was just kind of unimaginable five years before. So Flickr was early in that wave of consumer software, which then included things like MySpace and later Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and the kind of like standards of the web today. And so it was a really interesting journey because as we were building um, Flickr and it was growing, the kind of what was possible on the internet was growing at the same time. So there wasn't any particular model we were copying or something we were aspiring to be. We were kind of, you know, feeling, feeling our own way as we, as the product grew. Very, very interesting. And, The thing that comes to my mind in that case is what was it like to be bought by Yahoo? Because then has everything changed then because they are a bigger corporate at the moment or how was it? It was, uh, it was definitely a very different experience because we moved from being an office with eight people in Canada to joining what was at the time a 14,000 person company spread all around the world. And we moved down to 
down to San Francisco and worked out of the Yahoo headquarters. And, you know, we went from a small scra scrappy startup to being a very small piece of a very large company and a company that was very focused on advertising and on and anything else was kind of a distraction from that. So it was, it wasn't a great experience overall, but it's hard to say that if we hadn't done that, maybe nobody would have heard of Flickr today. Maybe it would have disappeared and never grown. And, you know, there's every chance that we would have messed it up if we stayed independent. Um, so I don't know that it was a mistake, um, but it, was, um, it wasn't a great experience being such a small piece of a large company and one that didn't really matter to it. At which point did you decide that you want to leave Flickr? Was it like, okay, I want to leave and do something new? Or was it like, uh, how, how was the situation when you decided to leave? What, what was the trigger? So um, Flickr came, uh, as a hint at that, Flickr came out of a video game we were trying to build before that called Game Never Ending. Um, and, uh, really what the, the, the team that, that founded Flickr and then went on to found the company that's become Slack, we really wanted to get back and build that game that we'd been unable to build. So we had this idea that we were really passionate about that we'd been unable to execute against the first time around just because the, it was a bad funding environment and the technology wasn't really there. Um, and we were a small team in Canada. It was difficult for us to get funding to make games. But after the success of Flickr, a few years after the acquisition, we really wanted to go back and try and build that game again. We really believed that it could be, um, you know, a, a really successful project and could be a successful business. And so we left Flickr to start um, a, the game that then became called Glitch. And so we worked on, after Flickr, we worked on this game for four years um, and we were spread between San Francisco and Vancouver. Um, and at its height, we had 45, 50 people working on this game and worked on it for four years. Um, but unfortunately, in the end, it turns out we're really just bad at making games um, and it didn't turn into a successful game or a successful business. Yeah, unfortunately, you, you found it slack from it so really really unlucky situation <laughs> um, well yeah i mean it's uh, it has definitely turned out all right now um but we didn't um set out to build um you know business collaboration software that was um like a very fortunate side effect of the way we were building the game so while we were working on the game we were mostly split between san francisco and vancouver and canada with our engineering in San Francisco and our game studio. So illustrators, animators, sound design, level design was all up in Vancouver. And from the very beginning of working on the game, we started using IRC, Internet Relay Chat, as the way we communicate. And so it was a tool that the founders we were all familiar with because we had used in the 80s and 90s. And it's a dead simple way of doing real-time uh, kind of collaboration. But it's very like unfull featured. So it hasn't really changed much in the last like three or four decades. Um, and it was a great technology for, um, for making us feel like we're working together in the same room. But over the four years that we were working on the game, we started bolting a lot of things onto IRC. So we started to, wanted to make it really easy to share files and uh, wanted to make sure that even if you weren't connected, you could go back and see what other people had said and then search what other people had said and be able to access that um, on your cell phone because uh, like using phones for work had only really just started taking off and this was nine years ago now. Um, And so we started building all of these things on top of IRC. We started posting more and more information, automated information into IRC as well. So anytime you know, a piece of artwork was finished and ready for approval or ready for animation or when a level design was finished or when somebody signed up for the game or bought something inside the game or a server crashed or a new version of our software was deployed, all this information got posted into IRC. And it made this virtuous kind of cycle where the more information we put there, the more people looked at it. And the more people looked at it, the more it made you want to put all information there. And so um, at the end of four years of building the game, we'd been where kind of everybody was using IRC exclusively. We had email and we had like a company-wide mailing list, but really it had like five emails over the course of four years. People, we used IRC for everything. 
and the tool set that we built around it. And when we shut the game down and we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do next, we realized that whatever it was we did, we would want to continue to work in the same way. So we want this collaborative tool set, this way of working together to continue. So we figured if we, a small development team, found this way of working really useful, then maybe other people would too. And that's where the idea for, for Slack came from. So we turned it into a product and, uh, and then the next five years have kind of been the evolution of that. That's quite interesting because I didn't know that the game started before Flickr and then Flickr turned out of the game itself as well. Um, that's yeah. new for me, yeah, but so the, b- very the, interesting. Uh, it is uh, the second time we have failed to make a game and turned it into something else. Yeah, but, but it works twice. So maybe maybe you should you should stick with with making games if you want to discover new business opportunities. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure two data points makes a very convincing line. No, I don't think like, so. That w- that was just not a joke. Try and make a game again. <laughs> but um, how was the if, when you decided that you have Slack as a communication tool or a corporation tool, co- collaboration tool? Sorry, um, for companies as well how did you start to reach out? So whom did you ask and how did you approach the, those companies? Because I don't, I don't think that it was easy at the moment at at, that, at this time, because as you said, it was starting to get off, to take off, but it was not really there. Yeah. Well, well, definitely when we first, you know, when we were first building Slack, people weren't using anything like it. So it wasn't, that we were trying to convince people to switch from this other messaging collaboration platform that they're using to Slack. It was switch from your mix of email and AIM and Skype and Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp and texting people and try this new kind of different tool. And the further problem that we had was that we couldn't convince a single person to use Slack. That didn't have any value. We would have to convince somebody to get their whole team to try it at the same time to see if they would find it useful. So it was a real struggle to get people to just give it a try to begin with in any kind of real sense. Um, And so where we started with was um, friends of ours in San Francisco at other tech startups and just like spent a few months cajoling them into trying it. So one of our very first alpha testers was um, the service Audio, which is now defunct, but was like a a Spotify competitor based in the States. Um, and after a few months of convincing, I got a small part of the engineering team to give it a try. And from there, it grew within RDO. And we saw a similar story within other kind of small friends companies. But the first kind of six months of life of Slack was a real uphill struggle to get anybody to even give it a try. So it's, you know, it's not replacing a tool you already have. And it's not necessarily filling a need that people felt that they had. Once people tried it, they, um, you know, adoption was really good, but trying to sell people on it initially was the hardest part. I know that at the time at TechCrunch, I, uh, well, we were starting to talk about, um, should you introduce your software as a service products via bottom up or top down approach? And what you were describing right now was more like the bottom up so that small teams are discovering the tool and using it itself and then empowering others to use it at at scale and in the whole company would you would you consider this strategy as one of the or did you did you stick to this approach or did it turn out that um, top down could also work i don't know how you sail or convince people at the moment even if, if even if they have to be convinced by for slack so uh, what how are you approaching new companies at the moment and how would you yeah i think it's uh you know the 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 way in which slack does it doesn't necessarily apply to every other service for the there are some services where it only makes sense to deploy something in a top down way where you know like absolutely the whole company has to use it or it doesn't make sense um but for, certainly for slack we it's a tool that is valuable for a small team to adopt it. And I think that's kind of the consumer-like approach that we've taken to the product is that there's this increasingly kind of bring your own device, bring your own app 
style of uh, what some have dubbed shadow IT happening within organizations where teams want to pick up the tool that works best for them. And so having this kind of self-serve model of you can come and try Slack and see if it works for your small team. And if it does, then expand from there has been very successful for us. Now, if we're deploying software to large companies, we also have to be able to work with their IT department and make sure we're working with their security team and tied into single sign-on and e-discovery and DLP and all the kind of um, administrative technologies and regulations that large companies care about. So that's important for deploying software to any large customer. But um, what we typically see is adoption by small teams within a large company first. You start to find it really useful, and then that makes the conversation around rolling it out to a whole company much more straightforward. Cool. Thank you so much. So it's not useful for every company or not, not possible for every company to go uh, bottom-up, but sometimes it might make sense and in other yeah, I think it's very dependent on the, on the kind of class of product that you're building. You know, I think for a team, a piece of team collaboration software like Slack, where it can be adopted by a small team within a larger company, that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, like a small team within a large company is unlikely to adopt its own single sign-on system, um, you know, or its own uh, legal archiving system. You know, some things that only make sense being deployed wall to wall, you know. Um, but we're, you know, luckily in a category where it makes sense for a portion or a whole company to use it. And so we've definitely concentrated on getting into new companies via that kind of bottoms up approach of providing a tool that a small team, a few individuals can pick up and find useful by themselves. And then the, if they're finding it useful, if they're getting value from it, then we see it grow within that organization to adjacent teams. Great. Um, what I realize at the moment is that you're enhancing communities via Slack on scale. So many of the um, cryptocurrency startups are all community, yeah, collaborating and also all of the communication is on Slack with their community, but also you're enhancing and embrace, not embracing, uh, enhancing and empowering uh, invite only communities for networking and whatever. And I think, this is also a huge part of Slack that's not told about or talked about all the time. It's more about the company collaboration aspect. But at the moment, I'm, I'm in so many Slack channels that are invite only or from some blockchain or cryptocurrency startups or whatever. And I see that there is way more power than the company product itself. How do you realize this at... Um, Slack and how do you think will it make or have more impact uh, in the next months or years? Yeah, I think we've, um, from fairly early on, we've seen um, non kind of non work social uses of Slack as a, an important kind of vector for, for growth for us. So while it's not like the use case that we concentrate on, um, you know, we're not trying to sell people to use Slack as a community tool. When people, you know, uh, somebody uses Slack at work, finds it super valuable and takes it outside of work to other contexts like community groups, social groups, developer groups, you know, uses it for event organizing, um, then that's a, a very useful kind of growth vector for us because it introduces a whole bunch of people who hadn't used Slack before um, and gets you know them introduced in a context where it's valuable and where there's collaboration happening. And that means they can then later take it into their own companies. Um, and so while it's not a kind of core use case for us or something we're concentrating on, I think it's, it's very valuable in terms of how we get not just word out that Slack exists as a category, but get a bunch of people familiar with how Slack can be used to collaborate in a group. Okay, so I it's more more the, the side just thing. My wife to organize our, you know, like our uh, groceries and our vacation. And it's like, it's a great tool for that too. Awesome, awesome. So I was just asking because I, I see it all the time and I think it's so powerful because that also is empowering and uh making the Slack community itself stronger. And I think that's that's valuable for the company as well. But of course, that are not always uh, clients or not everybody's turning out as a client for company collaboration tools. But um, I think 
that also the word of mouth here is is the, a factor that's that's really really interesting um yeah i think that's been you know the word of mouth of if you have a good experience using slack in one context then you're going to end up bringing it you know bring it into the workplace bring it into other teams you work with and that's definitely historically not been how any enterprise software has grown you know you don't hear from your friend about great expense reporting software or a really good cloud access security broker that i also use at home um but we're very luckily in a category where where that can make sense and where we can bridge from you know a business context to a personal one and back to business um so i think that's been really important for us so i made a few of my best contacts via slack so it's it's really helpful for me so <laughs> That's Thanks right. for the tool. Um, as we're always talking about emerging markets and um, the future and everything is bright, um, where do you see the future coming? And especially with your tech background, what do you think is, is um, the topic for the next years or where should people have an eye on? Oh, that's interesting. I think there's um, it's a lot of different, you know, um, directions that people are excited about now, whether it's like blockchain or AR and VR and um, things that are super hot. I think the the one that's actually finally going to start to really change our experience of using technology is AI and machine learning over the next few years. I think we've finally kind of um, got over that hump of people talking about it's coming really soon now and to the point where it's starting to actually be used in a lot of products we use today. So, uh, you know, whether that's the kind of the earliest piece is things like, you know, Facebook's algorithmic timeline of showing you, you know, things that, uh, that you care about most on a very personalized machine learning kind of level. And if we can start applying that kind of real applied machine learning to uh, everyday products, I think that's going to have the biggest impact over the next few years. So in terms of um, what we're doing at Slack, we're looking at, How can we use machine learning to be able to tell individual Slack users what the most important messages for them are? So we can look at your, you know, the way you've interacted with people in the past and the topics you talk about, the links you click on, the channels you participate in, the people you talk to, and figure out what are the things that you care about the most, which might be very different to the things your colleague cares about the most. Yeah. And to be able to apply that to the workplace to help you know, deal with the flow of information and prioritization of information, I think will be really interesting. So you are going for not um, giving a user too much content and overfloating him with content that he can't read everything or he reads just stuff that's not interesting or valuable for him? Um, I think that like the uh, one of the the hardest things to deal with in any kind of medium to large organization is like communication uh, between people and the flow of information. Um, and to the extent um, that we can start to use technology to kind of reduce that cognitive overhead, the idea that a lot of um, time spent by information workers today is spent seeking out answers to questions that have previously been answered. So it's like, you know, that could be from really simple stuff um, like how do I file an expense report or what is the time off policy here or like what is the status of project X or who knows about topic Y. You know, a lot of time is spent just trying to find the right person to ask a question to. And to the extent that we can, you know, use technology to reduce time spent doing tasks which uh, like it's kind of useless time spent by humans. Um, so that people can spend their working time on tasks that humans are uniquely suited to, you know, like actual information processing and decision making and creative work. Um, so I think to the extent that we can help people find answers to questions more quickly, um, you know, things that facts that are already known, I think that machine learning can be really helpful in the workplace. Yeah, I'll be very interested how you will in implement it to slack and how i will how if i will feel it or if it's just coming natural then so i think it will come natural but i'm i'm really happy to to use it when it's ready because mm -hmm. we are using it at our co-working space with uh, around 2000 people and i think that's uh, there it's there is a lot of uh, content that i not <laughs> want to see at the moment in a chat where some other information are more valuable and i have to search for so i think 
this will be a great um great tool and addition to to slack but as i said i think it's it's really really valuable and really really helpful for me <laughs> not that i i sound like the the guy who interviewed you at TechCrunch. So he was like, disturbing, disturbing. I don't think it's disturbing. So don't get, <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, as we, we, you talked about it a bit, blockchain. Um, I w- just want to ask you, do you think it's on a hype at the moment or do you think it has really, really great future? Or what do you think about term term blockchain cryptocurrencies whatever because it's so emerging at the moment that i'm like i don't know what to think about but what do the people that that have more knowledge think about it um i don't know i'm not entirely sure i think you know the the technology behind the blockchain is interesting but hasn't yet really found a, a use case that makes a ton of sense but is an interesting piece of technology cryptocurrencies Similarly, um, it seems like a uh, it isn't solving anybody's particular problem right now, um, but it's definitely uh, has so much excitement around it, um, so much money around it right now that uh, it will be interesting to see where it ends up in the next couple of years. I'm, uh, you know, it's an area I'm keeping an eye on, but uh, like it's just as plausible that there are no cryptocurrencies a couple of years from now as they become important in my mind, at least. But I think block, it'll be interesting to see what people do with um, with blockchain in general. You know, like what can we use a distributed ledger for? So do you have time to think yourself about blockchain or are you so involved in Slack that there is not a minute that you think about it? Because you as a techie, I, I think you might be interested in it a bit, but I, I don't know to which uh, which kind of uh, time con- uh, time aspect. So how much time do you spend? Yeah, no, I like to uh, to stay abreast of like all, you know, major technology development. So, you know, I, I do like to read some of the cryptocurrency uh, white papers and understand the underlying technology, but it's not an area that I spend a huge amount of time thinking or working towards. Okay. So, but is it is it um, something like a compliment for you that many of the bigger technologies or uh, crypto blockchain products use Slack to communicate with their community? Um, I think it's it's great that we're starting to really see that across all kinds of uh, community groups and industries. You know, like the, uh, I'm in, in the past, I spent a lot of time playing video games and now, you know, mo- many or most major gaming companies use Slack to build their games. That's super cool. You know, like many of the the brands and products that I use use Slack to to build those things, and that it's just uh, it's really strange. Um, it's a weird feeling, but it's very cool. So, which kind of games did you did you play? <laughs> uh, I played World of Warcraft for many years. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if they're a Slack customer, but a lot of uh, large game companies are Slack customers today. So maybe and, uh, you should uh, call them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from the line. I think it. It, it, it makes sense as well because, you know, Slack came from a games company. It was that exact kind of tight team collaboration that Slack was born from. So I think it, it has a natural home in, in game companies. Very interesting. Um, which, which book did you give away the most in the last few months or years? Is there one? Um. God, I don't know. I read a lot of books, but I, I, I mean, you, you listen to them on, on uh, yeah, oh, three times them. speed. So <laughs> yeah, no, I am. I am all about the audio books. So I think I listened to 130 books last year. Um, so that's crazy. I, know, I have a, uh, were there any real strong recommendations from last year? Oh, I really like um, series of three, maybe four books now by Ada Palmer, starting with to like the lightning. Um, and it's a like a future science fiction weird utopian society that it turns out it's all um, run by people murdering other people. So interesting book, worth read. Okay, so I have to check this out myself because I've never heard of a book like this. <laughs> so I, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing about um, the author about the storyline. So it may, might be interesting. Yeah, give it a try, Ada Palmer. <laughs> I, I will research. Um, 
I have so many more questions, but I know that I just have five to seven more minutes and I'm, I'm just thinking around which, what, what would I ask? What should I ask? What should I ask? <laughs> that, that's, that's hard at the moment. Um, I would go back to the, to the time when you started to get more employees and team members, because I think the hardest time for a startup and for a company is to get the right team members and we talked about it in the last interview as well um, that you said it's all about the team and about the people you are working with um, how did you select your first employees or also your co-founders because i think that's an interesting topic for everyone who is listening and starting their own projects Yeah, um, so there are four co-founders at Slack um, and we had all worked together on, well, we co-founded Glitch together, but before that we'd all worked together on Flickr as well. And so in some cases we've worked together for 10, 15 years. And I think that going into making Glitch and then Slack with the same group of people that you'd worked with for some time and that you felt really comfortable with, you understand each other's strengths and weaknesses and skill sets, Between us, you know, we had a lot of the areas covered that we needed to to start a technology startup. I think that was huge, you know, like I wouldn't want to start a company without the same people again. And it's really like that's, you know, when you're just, in our case, four people starting something, it's incredibly important, you know, the, the relationship that you have to those people. Um, and so I was really lucky that, you know, we found a really good group of people who were working on Flickr um, and that, you know, we're still working together today. And it's uh, to some extent, the early team was very similar. So when we first started working on Glitch, the first few people that uh, joined Glitch were people that we'd worked with before on Flickr or previous projects. Um, and then as Glitch turned into Slack, well, we um, more or less shut the company down at the end of the Glitch game. We kept a couple of people um, who we'd been working with on Glitch, you know, so we We already had a working relationship with them. We knew what their skill sets were. And we knew just what we needed to be able to build the Slack product. And so those first couple of employees were very, very important. Um, and uh, in our case, they're people that we'd, we'd worked with before and knew well. But um, through the first kind of year, everybody that we hired was, you know, a very key employee because every single person that you hire is going to have a big influence on um, not just the kind of outcome of the thing you're building but the culture of the company as well and what it feels like to work there um, and so we were very careful and took a lot of time over every hire in that first year and made sure that the person the person that we were hiring was exactly the the person that we wanted for that role you know so we were very careful about that hiring and hiring was a decision that you know involved everybody at the company um, and uh, that becomes it's obviously still very important to be hiring the right people as the company grows, but each individual hiring decision becomes, you know, less impactful over time. So it's much harder for one person to really change the direction and feel of the company over time. And so those first few hires were very, very important. How do you establish the culture of the company when you grow so rapidly to 1000 employees? Because I think, Having 10, 20, 30 people and um, having a culture is one thing. And then there is the thing to stay or develop the culture to a certain point when you're 1,000 people. How do, you, how do you manage this? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that it's very different how you, how you do that with different kind of scales of people. Um, and there are a few, you know, growing from, we started at Slack with eight people and now we're over a thousand. There's been a few definite inflection points in that growth. So, you know, the, like the point at which you can't, you don't recognize everybody in the office is a real, uh, you know, you can't name everybody by name. You don't necessarily recognize whether somebody works here or not. That's a really strange inflection point. It feels very different to when you're all just a few people in a small room. Um, and I think, um, 
early on, you're very intentional about the things that you want the company to be and the way you want it to feel, but not like in a, you write down a manifesto way, but in a, in a way where that just happens as a, like a natural, you come into the office every day and choose how to spend your time and how you structure your meetings and, you know, how you, how you get work done. Um, but as the company has grown, it's been important to kind of write down what we feel our values are and what we feel is important about the way the company works and what we feel is not important and is going to change as the company grows. You know, working at Slack today with a thousand people is very different to working at Slack four years ago when there were 10 people. Um, um, you know, we've kept some of the same things and many of the other things we've thrown away and, you know, reinvented a few times since. But understanding what our important values were that we really wanted to retain and then writing those down, using that, you know, when we hire people to decide who we want to hire um, and who we want to attract, talking to new hires and consistently internally about what our values are and what we value as a company, I think has been really important. So writing that down, deciding what it was that's kind of core to working at Slack and then being consistent about it. Great. Thank you so much. In regard of the time, I would say um, this was my last question, even if I have some more, but maybe maybe we can we can uh, make it when I'm in, or oh, let me think, San Francisco. Yes. And uh, I, can, I can invite you and Julia for lunch, dinner, whatever, because uh, that was very, very... I, I'm so thankful that I have the opportunity again. Um, thank you so much, both of you. Thanks for the interview. And I'm... Um, so happy um i wish you a great day i know that you have just uh 10 a.m or something no now it's 11 nearly and we have here it's uh in the evening so i wish you a great day um wish you a successful day and uh happy to hear from you yeah that was great have a great rest of your day thank you so much thank you fabian Thank you, Julia. That will be in the interview as well. <laughs> oh, good, good. Thank you. I wish you a great day. Okay. Thanks, Fabian. Bye. Bye. I hope that you enjoyed the interview as much as I did and that you could take away something for your own business, for your own projects, for yourself. So I think the story is very interesting. You can take a lot from it. And... If you want to recommend somebody for an interview as a guest or want to participate yourself, then send me an email to fabian at yup.email. Yup is yut, no, J-U-P. And I would love to connect with you. And if you have any questions or recommendations, just send me an email. You'll find it again in the show notes. And I wish you a great day. And hopefully we hear or listen to each other in the next episode. Episode, 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 episode.